I originally uh, started in medicine as a physician's assistant and then did a career change and got into construction, both iron worker, cranes, and concrete, um, 40 some odd years doing mostly commercial, a lot of buildings in Las Vegas. I've worked internationally on big lifts and um, drill rigs, refineries, you name it, uh, both um big stuff. And then I got into a residential looking for more sustainability and then got interested in not only materials, but methods. So that's what brought us into Geopolymer International. Geopolymer International was a material side to the education. There's a Geopolymer Institute in France is where we both most get our education from a Geopolymer Chemistry and Applications book uh, authored by Professor Davidovitz. Um, so we're his students. There's other camps out there that believe in alkaline activated concretes, which we tend to stay away from since they're hazardous. And we go into a real premium geopolymer philosophy. Okay. And so while we're here, can you describe what a geopolymer is? Now, this is for sure. an engineering audience that, that loves as many technical details as possible. Geopolymer is basically your original cements. As mankind progressed, they got into both the uh, Roman type cements and the ceramic type cements. And that's where your porcelain and ceramics and that um, line of binders came from. So geopolymer is basically a ceramic cement. That's where a lot of these ancient structures that will use these methods of uh, solidifying rock, you could say it's an imitation granite rock, using mostly silica and uh, lumina. And it's a, a process that is um, been developed by Professor Davidovitz, and we're now bringing it out to the market to be able to have a more sustainable um, solution to the Portland issues. Okay, could you talk a little bit about some of those sustainability issues and why the, the local sourcing of geopolymers is so important? Well, let, let's look at uh, Portland first. Um, Portland was invented 200 years ago, named after an island that looks similar to their masonry. Um, and it basically has its issues. It's a water-based material. Portland uh, is responsible for 8% of the CO2 emissions because of the the energy that it takes to make the clinkers made into the cement. Um, it only lasts 50 to 100 years. There's no Portland that is over 150 years old because a carbonization starts to change the chemistry and it deteriorates. So basically we're building society on a material that is not, um, has a, a, a usability more than a hundred years is kind of crazy. Then we have to come back and rebuild. Um, Portland is the second most used material on the planet, only second to water. Uh, it's not fireproof. It's not waterproof. It doesn't stand up to acid, which is basically our, our, our sewage. Um, and then we have to come back, rebuild it, which is kind of the exact opposite of sustainability. Can you talk a little bit about then why the geopolymers are different and how that they, they last longer and, and why is Portland used so much more up until up until now? Sure. Well, we're we're talking about ceramics, so alumina silica. So glass is a a medium that's very strong, long lasting, fireproof, and everything else. So in the ceramics field, you're basically making your cements based on glass. That is your binder. Where in Portland, your your calcium is your binder, and that's why it deteriorates. Well. Um, geopolymer is fireproof, waterproof, and acid resistant, and lasts for thousands of years. And we know this by the monoliths and the other structures that have already been made before us thousands of years ago that are still standing and in pretty good condition today. You have different methods of making geopolymers. There's not just one. Um, depending on the materials you use, if it's clay, rock, volcanic, granite, um, even calcium has a method. But what we focus mainly on is the um, usability. Um, we are a very safe material um, and natural. Basically, a polymer is a long chain of molecules, and we're linking them together with matrix of crystals of glass, silica. That's why it comes out so strong. It's a higher strength, both flexual and compressive. 
Uh, it is more expensive, but we're working every day to lower those costs because some of the materials we have are very highly processed and we're trying to get down to um, lessen the process to make them much more um, economically available. So that is basically what uh, geopolymer focuses a, a lot on. Um, and what we do is we try and work with people because there's that general rule of construction, anything over 500 miles away is too expensive to build with. So we look to work with people to look at their geology locally to see what's available for us to be able to process and then make into a local geopolymer formula. Okay, so what were some of your goals when you found a geopolymer? And do you feel that you're achieving those goals? My goals were to be able to start making some alternatives and, and creating answers for the problems that we have today. For us to continue to use a material that has a short uh, lifespan, serviceability, is really crazy. So after researching to see what the ancients used and now bringing that forward, we're looking at a more sustainable material as the world starts looking for one. Um, lots of countries have already looked at the big a uh, problem with Portland, Japan has already outlawed it by 2050. They can no longer use Portland. The EU and the United Nations, uh, that's their third topic of what are we going to do about Portland? So our goals are to be able to bring the technology out and help people develop the new industry and have an alternative that's sustainable. Okay, you briefly one time mentioned um, the, the Roman cement, and that's gotten some news because it's been shown to, to last longer than the regular kind of concrete that's been made Portland concrete. How is that not sustainable? And, and what are geopolymers advantages over, over that version of, of concrete? Well, you have two different types of Roman concretes. You have the calcium based, the lime based, where they burnt the um, seashells and used uh, volcanic ash. And then you have the more poslins and ceramic bases, more of the glass um, binder that I talk about. Um, so we are on the Roman cement of, of where their pottery and their um, waterproofing uh, came from. Um, there again, the technology is um, daunting. You're actually creating crystal matrix to link together through chemistry. So the chemistry is not your average easy add water and go. We don't actually add water. We use a, a silicate, a water glass. Um, or a uh, what I call a salt brine with glass mix. And that reacts with the, the minerals the, that are linked together to create those matrix. So it's some heavy duty technology, but when it comes down to simplic simplicity of use, you start getting a lot of remarkable benefits of, of very, you can actually time your curing rates. Um, you gain most of your strength in the first uh, three days. Um, you have an adherence to where you don't tend to have a cold joint. If you do it correctly, it fuses together. Um, the nice thing about geopolymer, it's recyclable. You can actually crush it and reuse it. So sustainability starts going off the chart. Since we're using a saline or a salt water and not a fresh water, Portland uses over 1 trillion liters of fresh water a year, not another non-sustainable item. But us using a salt um, mitigates the ability to be able to um, use the material in more freezing weather. You can get down below freezing and still use a, a, a concrete. Um, we can also now, uh, we developed a system to be able to recycle Portland uh, rubble. Uh, we can now take that and make it into concrete again with geopolymer and make it last then hundreds to thousands of years However, it tends to only be the strength that that Portland was because your aggregates always dictate your compressive strength. So we can then recycle that and start bringing it back into the mainstream. On our website, we have a composites page where we're now taking other items, recyclables, uh, rubber tires, plastic bottles, um, hemp, polystyrene, you name it. And we're making different classifications of building materials that are then fireproof and very strong. So we're looking at different areas to be able to make and replace different materials that we're still using wood and uh, um, a lot of steel that might not be necessary in the future if we start looking at uh, available technologies we have today. Uh, one of the exciting things that we got into was the 3D concrete printing. 
Um, we now have what I believe is one of the best printers, the Maxi printers, which is a, a ro uh, roboticized um, spider crane. It's been hacked and it's been computerized. So now we have a machine that you can go through a 36 inch door, open up and start printing and then lift that to the next floor. And what my focus is, is low cost housing with sustainable materials, um, being able to start reversing some trends and the, the directions that we we think we need to, to build in um, and challenging some of those um, those philosophies and technologies um, to, to change and get more sustainable and look at what we're actually doing as we try and create structure for people on the earth. So when and how did you get involved into the 3D printing? And can you summarize kind of how it fits into the organization? Um, well, I, I'm a general contractor. Um, well, I think I got like 36 years or 46 years now. I'm getting older um, and I love technology. And as I watched the technology develop from very infancy in China and the Philippines and then coming to, to the United States and then blossom with the big house builders dumping a bunch of money into it. I started looking at what this new industry is going to need and um, having been a student in the geopolymer field and realizing that a structural mortar, something that's not dependent on, on shrinkage from because of evaporation of water, it's not a water-based material, and it needs a high strength and longer durability and fireproofing um, geopolymer fit to build perfectly. And as we worked with the formulations and started playing with them a little bit more, it just got better and better especially when you can start recycling your, your waste material and throw it back into the mix. Um, it's an alkaline material. So the cleanup and the wastewater we um, generate, uh, we filter a lot of it and then dump any particulates back into the mix. But the uh, sewage treatment plants love it. it. It is an alkaline water that helps them neutralize the acids of sewer. Um, which then we also able to uh, actually spray geopolymer on Portland cement and make it more uh, acid resistant. So the benefits just keep on coming up. I, I um, really need to sit down and write a book on all the ins and outs of geopolymers, but I think Professor Davidovitz got most of it in the chemistry and applications. Could you describe some of the ways engineers can lessen carbon emissions in the way they design and use technology? you have to go back to the materials that we're using basically and the techniques that we're using to assemble it um construction basically is just a very wasteful occupation we throw away a lot of waste um, we overbuild we um use a lot of wood for forming cement the 3d printing system now is actually just a form printer and then you put your rebar and you core port uh, so there's a lot of technology that cuts uh, away from those other resources like wood and um, the getting away from plastics and things like that and really looking at what we're using. And then, of course, the structure. What do we build and what is the longevity of that structure? Or is this for residential, generational, for industrial, long-lasting? Are our bridges going to last over 100 years? And we really have to start looking at that um, basic special use of what we're actually generating and the longevity that we're getting out of it to really assess, are we doing the best we can? How can engineers better interface and work with construction teams and the professionals so that both groups are achieving sustainability goals better? Education. Get back to educating yourselves on the new technologies and materials that are available, including geopolymer. You don't have to use geopolymer in our printers. You can use whatever you like. There's a lot of great materials out there. But being able to start uh, embracing some of the new technologies because construction has been stuck in the mud for so long on the same techniques and over and over again, we know the engineering. We know what we need to do. And we need to now institutionalized new materials and methods that will be able to get us there. Um, that's um, robotics um, is going to be a huge in our future. Uh, we do not have the same workforce that we had 15, 20 years ago. Uh, people don't want to get into construction. It's too laborious and, and it really doesn't need to be. And it, it's uh, basically the 
the responsibility of our engineers to be able to help us out of this. This is the ones, the smart guys that got the education and know the ins and outs of what we need to do. We just need to work together to help develop those systems and not be afraid of just cost is everything. We need to now look at sustainability and, and just what kind of quality are we putting out? Okay, so so maybe one specific thing that you could tell engineers to do to 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 make this this process all work better. Are you kidding? Uh, learn what geopolymer is. Start less looking at alternative material. Uh, the the concrete, the largest used material on the planet, is only after water is got to be it. We're using a material that's only last fifty to one hundred years. This is crazy. We're building a society on some really crappy calcium binder. It's like uh, trying to set it all up on a reef and have a big storm come through. It's not going to last. It, it deteriorates and falls apart. And we have alternative that our forefathers showed us. This material is still there. Um, everybody thinks that it was made one way or they carved it and moved these blocks. They were much smarter. They were better engineers then, I guess. Uh, because if they can pull that off and we can't even pull it off today, well, shame on us. But they also led the way. Even MIT has done researches on, on what were these materials made out of. Let's look back to our ancient antiquity and see what these guys were up to because they're still there. The structures are sound. They're, the engineering was phenomenal. The way they, they linked and, and locked blocks together. It's just, I don't know where they got it, but they had a few smart guys back then too. And they most likely were the pre predecessors of engineers. Basically, what my whole thing in the beginning was is bringing some answers to the next generations to help them with the problems we're creating for them today. If you could put me in a caption, that would be it.